Hello, Jack. Hello, Mike. How are you? Hey, Alex. Good. Hey, it's Jack. a great Good honor. Time. Yeah, great honor to, for Hydra, for all Hydra crew to have you on board this year. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you, Jack. It's really great to have you. And before we'll get started to your presentation, I had like one small question for you. Uh, how you like? What was your way for distributed system engineering or overall? So, um, for most of my career, I've always been focused on data systems. Um, but it all started in distributed systems for me back in 2013 when the Jepson tests first started getting published and I just found it fascinating and it lit up my curiosity and you know prior to that I was deep in relational databases and you know I had to understand how they worked under the hood for the kind of performance projects I used to do and then I just they opened my eyes to distributed systems data systems and I just started studying how they worked slowly read papers and then you know that carried on for a few years I was still a consultant using these systems but then I kind of stumbled into testing RabbitMQ. Uh, there was a new Raft-based Q type. And so I just built my own RabbitMQ-focused Jepson testing and got the beta, broke the beta like five, six betas until we finally nailed it down, broke a couple of other features, and ended up joining the team, the core team, based on that work. And then from there, I carried on testing and started writing code on distributed systems. And, and now I'm working on, on Apache Bookkeeper and a little bit of Pulsar, doing a bit of everything from testing to writing code, you know, troubleshooting, you know, production issues. So I kind of really got into it just through, through curiosity and, uh, and just spending time learning how these systems worked. And I just found it fascinating. So. Wow. It's, that's it's really so how it happened. It's, yeah, it's, it's really <laughs> so, great. I'm honestly thrilled to listen to your talk, and uh, let's start presentation. Ladies okay. and gentlemen, Jake Van Lantley. Okay, so today's <laughs> talk is um, it's about something that is uh, I'm quite passionate about, which is modeling. Um, and you know, why do we do modeling in distributed systems? Um, and what modeling technologies, modeling and verification, what is out there? And my chosen technology in the last two or three years has been TLA plus, but you know, it all started with Jepson for me. And so when I found out about Maelstrom and how you can run kind of Jepson testing on kind of it, on, on toy implementations of distributed systems, it got me wondering, wondering if you could use it for modeling it also. And so started this kind of experiment that I've done. And this is kind of, this talk is kind of the culmination of that. So I've already been introduced. So work for Splunk. And most of my time is working on the on Splunk's um, data streaming platform or Bookkeeper and a tiny bit of Pulsar. So what we'll cover, why do modeling at all? And then we'll look at a bit, bit about TLA plus, very short introductions, don't have time for anything in depth. Um, uh, look at Maelstrom and Jepson, and then look at this case study where I decided to implement a distributed log storage system, um, but a model of one uh, using both TLA plus and Jepson. And these are kind of based on Apache Bookkeeper. So as usual, a lot of these talks start by saying distributed systems are hard, and that is very true. There are so many things to take into account. So many things that can go wrong, messages getting lost, messages getting reordered, clock skew, nodes catching on fire, you got versioning where you change the version of a state machine and it you know, bricks all the others. Uh, you've got now is a, 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 everyone is scrambling to make sure that auto scaling is working and auto scaling a data system is, is not so easy. So, and then you've got security concerns. So there's a lot going on and you know, we're going to look at why modeling can help. So it usually starts with a design doc. So this is a screenshot of a design doc from Pulsar about its transaction system. And so it will go into the motivation, the background, a bit of the context, some diagrams, and all the components and interactions. Everyone will get together and agree after you know, much discussion on, on the design. And then perhaps we'll just you know, jump into implementation. But there are many mistakes to be made along the way, many you know, dead ends. Um, 
And who's to even say by the time we get to the finished product that we're going to have exactly what we wanted? Jepson tests themselves have shown how many data systems do not actually deliver the guarantees that they say. And all of this can take multiple man years from the design doc to the product. So let's take an example. I have invented the roundabout, OK? So it's revolutionary. It's going to replace all traffic intersections that have traffic lights. And it's a continuous flow model, less accidents, less pollution. So we get started. We start implementing. And you know, there's some problems. We have to start thinking about putting some uh, optimizations in. But you know, our competitors are adding features, and we need to add more features and more optimizations. And you know, we're learning as we go, making mistakes, fixing them. Here we got a pedestrian walkway, which has traffic on it. So that's going to have to be fixed. Uh, then we want more features, railway lines, monorails. We have to have more optimizations. And before we know it, we've got a system that works but we're not entirely sure how it all works at a low level. The threading model is complicated. Certain bugs that we're getting indicate that maybe we've got some kind of memory leak. We're not really sure. And so, but wow, have we learned a lot in the process. In the two years it's taken us to build this thing, we've learned so much. If we could just turn back the clock, what would it look like if we kind of could start again from scratch? So maybe we might have built this. You know, we've got our roundabout, we've got our pedestrian walkway, our monorail, we've got our train tracks. You know, things are a lot more organized. Uh, you know, we're taking care of all the traffic. You know, maybe, maybe we could have built this if we had to do it again. So one of the things about modeling is we're trying to get to this the first time, maybe increase the likelihood of reaching this situation and perhaps even in less time. So we still start with a design doc, as always, as we as we always will. Um, but we inc we include a modeling and verification process in that, where one feeds into the other. We do this kind of extra upfront work to make sure that we're building the right thing, that the design will deliver the guarantees that we think. It's great for sharing with other people, and so with this bit of upfront work, we can actually save time overall and make hopefully fewer mistakes along the way. And what properties should our models have? Well, we want them to ideally be small and malleable. We want to be able to change them. We don't want them to be huge and complicated, because part of this is about sharing information and learning. We want to reduce them just to the core behavior. We don't want to have to think about threading models and memory management. We want to be able to internalize it. We want to, and I put easy here in quotes because some of these systems are very complex. You know, what we're trying to model is complex. So you can't get around that. But we want to remove as much kind of extraneous clutter so that we can see the core behavior for what it is. And if we can make that a verifiable model and we can actually get some kind of proof or some confidence that it's right, then that's just brilliant. And maybe it will even be that living documentation that people always talk about but you know, we don't often deliver. So two tools, they are apples and oranges. They are very different. And you know, we're not going to pretend that one is the replacement for the other. But when you're building something like a distributed data system, they actually have a surprising amount of overlap that maybe we can actually you know, do some kind of comparison. So let's have a look at TLA Plus first. So TLA plus is a specification language, and it's really kind of composed of like three aspects. So you've got your constants and variables. So that's where all your state lives. Then you've got a bunch of actions, which mutate those variables. And then we've got a bunch of properties we care about. You know, does it lose data? You know, will a client get the wrong answer? That kind of thing. And then what can we model with it? Well, we can kind of model anything. Here's an imaginary system, OK? It doesn't exist. But let's just say we want to create a specification to model the whole thing. Well, we can do that by extracting the complexity of each individual component. We can create a high-level specification for the entire system. Then we could say, well, these transaction controllers down here, that's pretty complex stuff. Maybe we should actually, at a low, lower level, also specify that 
and maybe also the recovery system, which actually int integrates with three different components. And we can do that. We can even take a low-level concurrent hash map that we decided to implement and check that that design is right. And it's all about the design rather than the implementation. It's about algorithmic thinking. So it's not what, uh, sorry, it's not how, but what. So we don't care about low-level programming considerations. Imagine you were on a whiteboard describing the design, but you had to include all the threading and error handling and network buffer management and everything like that. It would be a nightmare. And so TLA plus is kind of like the whiteboarding, the, the, the modeling where we describe the design in terms of its algorithm rather than how and its implementation. So it's all about states and actions. So what is a state? So a state is really just a snapshot in time of all the variables. So let's say we have a specification here that has just two counters, counter one and counter two. So one state might be that they're both at zero. And another state might be that counter two has been incremented to one. And what takes us from one state to another state is a step. And so you get a step and another step and another step, and you get these state transitions. And an action is what does that. So an action here would be an increment. And then we have this kind of state space. So in our two counters example, for all, if we wanted to look at all the states between them both being set to zero and them both being set to two, this is what it would look like. So you could go from counters, you could increment counter one, and then you could increment counter two, and then one, and then two, or you could go for two, 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 one, one. As you can see, there's like six different possible paths through this state space. And each path is called a behavior. Now, invariants are things that must not happen. These are called safety properties, OK? And it's about a particular state that we don't want to happen. So let's just say this uh, particular state here, this red with the dots, uh, that's a bad state. That basically means that maybe we lost data, you know, or maybe that's where a client gets the wrong answer. Well, we want to avoid that state, and we don't want any of the behaviors that our system can produce to reach that state. But we can see from this example that actually three of our six possible behaviors does reach it. And we can see uh, the, all the kind of steps that got us there. And actually, the model checker TLC of TLA+, Plus, it will actually be able to print us out the sequence of actions that led to that bad state. And that's called an error trace. Then you have liveness. Liveness is about that something good should eventually happen. You know, the invariants are just saying what shouldn't happen. And liveness says what should happen eventually. So let's just say that now we decide, do you know what? We're going to allow counters to decrement as well as increment. Now we can get a lot more behaviors, much longer behaviors, going through our state space. But now it looks like we can actually introduce cycles. And once we're in this cycle, we'll never reach uh, the, the state that we want, which is that both counters are at two. And so this would actually be a violation of that liveness property. So a quick summary of TLA plus. We can kind of like model anything. You know, there's some areas like probabilistic um, things which are very you know, not ideally suited to TLA+, but we can pretty much model anything at any different kind of level of abstraction. It's all about algorithmic thinking, because we don't want to have to be thinking about programming considerations, you know, like threading and whatnot. And that makes it easier to reason about. And so then we have multiple verification options. We can go for model checking, which is my preferred option as I'm a busy engineer. Uh, and you have TLC and Appalachia. And then you've got proofs, which take a lot more work, but they can kind of get around some of the limitations of model checking. So what about Maelstrom? OK, so Maelstrom is just kind of a nice wrapper for Jepson in the end. And so the Jepson tests are very famous in the distributed systems world. They have broken many, many a distributed system and shown that they do not offer the guarantees that they claim. The guarantees they claim are the nice shiny rainbow. And then Jepson comes along and shows the dumpster fire that's underneath. And so um, this is pretty well known in the distributed systems world. Um, and, but it's a very focused tool. It's focused on distributed data systems 
and check in that they deliver either the ice transaction isolation or the consistency levels that they claim. And so this image is taken from Jepson IO, and it's a good place to read about consistency levels and learn about what they mean and uh, the kind of different ones that exist. There are many more, um, and they can get pretty complicated. So Jepson tests, what they do is basically you create a workload where it will deploy your system. So let's just say we have three nodes here, and it will be able to kind of mess with it. It'll be able to cut network links, change clocks. I mean, it's got many, many different things it can do to perturb the system. So it runs these perturbations, and then at the same time, it's running the workload, which is a series of clients that are sending concurrently operations against the cluster. So this is an example of, say, a linearizability workload where we have writes and reads and compare and set operations. And then it will check that the results it gets back have a, are a history that are valid for your chosen consistency level. But it's a black box. It cannot see inside the system. It's, with TLA+, Plus, we get full access to the full state. Everything is global state. We get access to all of it. But with Jepson, it's not like that. We get input and we get output. And we make sure the output matches the input. And so this is an example of, say, a linearizability check, which fails. The system is not, produces a history which is not valid. So we do a write to a register. Great. We read it, get back one. Brilliant. So we do a write of three. OK. Then we do a compare and set of two to three, which is wrong. So it fails, which is correct, because it is not two, it's set to three. And then we do another compare and set, which is good because we change it from three to four. And then we do a read and it returns three, which is wrong. It should be four. We've just done a compare and set. And so this is not a linearizable history. And so this is an example of the sort of things that, uh, that these are your invariants with Jepson. What is Maelstrom? So Maelstrom allows you to run Jepson testing on your code. So there is no deploying to servers. There is no network. It's all run from within the Maelstrom process. And the network is now standard in and standard out. As long as your code speaks JSON through standard in and standard out, Maelstrom will do all the forwarding of the messages to the right nodes. It also controls the network now. And so it can cut connections. It can introduce latency and do things like that. And what's great is it's just you know, you choose the language, right? I mean, this is whatever you want, Python, Ruby, Java, C++, anything that you want. Uh, you just give it a binary, and Maelstrom will run it for you. And it has various workloads, like gcounter, gset. So these are different types of workloads, depending on what you've built. So in my, uh, in my example, we've gone for a linearizable KV uh, workload. Um, there's also services. So let's just say your proposed system has a dependency, like an external dependency on something like a KV store. Well, you don't actually have to implement that code yourself. There are services offered by Maelstrom for things like that. So you don't have to always implement these external dependencies. And then at the end, it gives you a pass or fail gives you a whole log of message passing. It actually gives you a nice visualization of the message passing, which is nice. Uh, it, you get all the logs from Maelstrom itself, all the logs from your code, and a bunch of statistics around latency and stuff like that. There are demos. So you can just go to the GitHub. Uh, there's a link at the end. And you can explore and run this stuff yourself. So you can play around with Raft implemented in Python. This is all bare bones, minimal code. In memory, this is just the most you know, cut down to the you know, pure core of Raft possible. OK, so it's small and easy to read. So I highly recommend that you look at it. So a summary of Maelstrom. So it's oriented towards distributed data systems. Uh, it runs your code, any language. Verification is via input versus output rather than internal state. Uh, the network is standard in and standard out JSON messages. You get a bunch of workloads and checkers for free. You can implement your own. Um, and it's via simulation. So ver verification is via simulation with, with perturbations. 
So from that, we could get a first take. So just based on that information, we can kind of start sizing them up against each other. So TLA plus allows you to choose your arbitrary levels of abstraction. Uh, and you could, for a large system, actually define multiple specifications. And you could uh, abstract complex parts of the system and focus on another, or you can focus on very low-level pieces. It's up to you. And state is just a bunch of variables. You have global state. And so your invariants can inspect that global state. And so um, you know, it's really good, very powerful uh, way of uh, checking your invariants. Maelstrom, on your hand, the other hand, is black box checking. So it's input versus output, which means that you, know, you have to offer an abstraction boundary that for Maelstrom where it can, where it can uh, verify the invariants, which is the histories of the input versus output against your chosen consistency level. With TLA+, plus, there is no wall clock time. Things just happen. Um, you know, you can you abstract parts of the system that you don't need to detail. For example, with my test, I have a dependency on Zookeeper. I do not need to model leader election. I can just say leaders leaders change, and that's it. It just happens. Uh, is it correct? Is my is my algorithm correct? Given that at any time the leader can change, I don't care how the leader is chosen. That is not. Uh, my focus. Whereas with Maelstrom, you know, it truly is a distributed system. Okay, it runs in the really real world where time exists, so you don't get to have any magic. You know, if you have a leader a change, it's because there's failure detection, and then you need to have a good way of choosing a leader. You can't fake it. You actually have to implement it. So you have to implement more things. TLA plus is algorithmic thinking. Uh, whereas Maelstrom is actual programming. Now we have threading and concurrency, error handling, the memory model. So we have some lower level concepts that now you know, we need to take into account. And going back to that, in TLA plus, state is a bunch of variables. We have global state, and our invariants can inspect that global state at any time. So in Maelstrom, we can have bad internal states, but Maelstrom won't necessarily see it. Most of the time, it depends on which protocol you're implementing, a bad internal state should lead to a bad history, which should lead to then Jepson failing, uh, giving you a nice failure. But sometimes these internal states can, can be hidden. It might not actually manifest as an invalid history. So that's something, something we also need to take into account. Another difference that we can see is the state enumeration versus simulation. So in many of these systems, we can categorize the message passing and the actions into two kind of broad categories. The control plane, for example, leader elections, you know, failure detection, uh, and the data plane, which is our steady state. This is where we want to be most of the time. If we can be in the data plane all the time, we're just replicating our messages, you know, we're pushing data through the system, that's great. So with TLC, which is the model checker that I use for TLA+, it explores every, the whole state space. You know, it doesn't care about control plane, data plane. One is as likely to occur as the other. Whereas with Maelstrom, it's using simulation and perturbations. So what does this mean? So with Maelstrom at the bottom here, so let's say our, our control plane are the, are the white uh, and the data plane is the black. So it will carry out a perturbation. So let's say a network partition. And then the control plane will come in. Maybe there'll be a leader action, there'll be message passing, and then the leader will be established, and then we're back to the steady state of replication. And that just carries on until the next perturbation. And then we get more control plane. And so we get this, uh, how, given that the control plane is often the most complex piece, and it's the piece that we really, really want to check in detail, but it can be slow to actually produce enough of these kind of uh, uh, control plane events, you know, we might have to run this thing for hours or days. Who's to know? And with TLR Plus and TLC, it's kind of like well, one's as much as likely as the other. I mean, we're not 
running in real time. We're actually exploring a state space with breadth first search. You know, and so it's kind of easier to really hammer or you basically explore the entire state space around the control plane with TLC. So let's have a look at my little experiment. So it's kind of like modeling bookkeeper. Um, I already uh, kind of cheated, I guess, because I had already implemented the lowest level of the protocol when TLA plus back in December. Um, but there's a whole bunch of bookkeeper that I haven't yet learned and I haven't actually modeled in TLA plus. Uh, and so my experiment is to build what I already understood of bookkeeper in Maelstrom, given that I'd already done it in TLA plus, and then build the rest of it up uh, in both. Uh, and I didn't cheat. I didn't look at the bookkeeper code to work out how they had done it. So it's about different abstraction levels. So we, it's a distributed log, OK? So that means it's just a log structure, right? So the top abstraction, it's just a log. You write to the head, and you read from any position. We don't care that it's distributed yet. Then at a lower level, well, actually, this is Apache Bookkeeper, so it's a segmented log. So we have a log of logs where we write to segments, and we append segments to the list to make uh, a long log. And then at the lowest level, actually, each segment is written to multiple Bookkeeper nodes. Uh, there's a bunch of metadata to say, well, which nodes is this segment stored on? Uh, what is the status of the segment? And so, and this is where the real meat and complexity of the protocol is at its lowest level. And we basically have a serving layer, which is stateless. So this is something like Apache Pulsar, which is, uses Bookkeeper for its storage. And this is where all the complexity lies. The storage layer is just, you know, network uh, attached storage almost. It's just really dumb uh, storage nodes that are really fast at storing and retrieving data. And then we've got uh, Zookeeper for the metadata. And we've got a bunch of invariants we care about. So we have to chain these segments together to form a, a log. And so but at the same time, we can have multiple different clients battling over control. So there should only be one leader at a time. But leaders can fail over. We could have split brain where there's two leaders. And we need that this chain of segments is still correct, even in the face of those situations. So if we ever have a situation where one segment has been left out, that's an invariant violation. If we ever have two open segments, that's an invariant violation. If we have any ordering problems where we get uh, you know, entries across segments or entries in a single segment or the actual segments themselves being added in the wrong order, that's an invariant violation. We also care about, at the lowest level, uh, can we truncate any given segment? And so, and this is where the most of the complexity of the protocol lies. Uh, you might have one node trying to close a segment, while another node, both thinking their leader, is trying to write to the segment. And can one close the segment at entry five, while the other one carries on writing and gets in entry six? That would be data loss, because any readers would only read up to five. So that's something we need to check for. So let's have a look at the models. In the end, uh, I went for two specifications for TLA+. At the bottom here, the lowest level specification is all about the lifetime of any single segment, how it's written to multiple bookkeeper nodes, the operations for opening and closing. Uh, and it's where most of the complexity lies, 922 lines. Um, but once proven that this is correct and that we can say, hey, the close operation is safe, then actually we can implement a lower level specification for the chaining of segments and say, oh, yeah, we just close the segment. We know that actually there's a whole lot more to that close operation. But we've already proven that's good in that low level specification. Now, in our higher level specification, we simply abstract close and assume it's safe. I didn't implement discovery, leader election, failure detection, anything like that. Stuff just happens. At any time, another node can become the leader. At any time, uh, one node can try and close a segment while another one's trying to write to it. Uh, I don't 
you know, a lot of this we actually delegate to Zookeeper, and I'm not going to be proving that Zookeeper is correct. So this is a look at the next state formula, which is you know a very uh, key part of any specification. Um, we're not going to go into TLA plus itself in this talk. I highly recommend you go to the TLA plus workshop, where they'll you know give you uh, <laughs> give you the blue pill so you can go down the rabbit hole. Um, but basically, this is basically saying that in at any moment there exists a client in our list of clients that could become a leader, or they could abdicate or they could try and close a segment, or they can come try and open a segment, and everything around this segment chaining. You see from the middle here that it actually fits all in this uh, in, in Visual Studio Code. I don't know what you call, that, you call that window, but it all fits in. It's not very long. It's 300 lines. Uh, and when I run it, it's rather small, uh, 2 million different states, of which 375,000. And this is for something like five competing clients all trying to 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 write to the to the leg to the segments, um, so it's actually rather simple small spec. Then we've got the segment lifecycle. This is where the most of the complexity is. It's about a thousand lines. You can see here on the right here that maybe about a quarter of that is comments. I tend to put in, you know, it's recommended in these specifications to to comment your code to enhance readability. The state space is massive. If I run it with a replication factor of three, so every entry of the log is written to three bookkeeper nodes, but there's four in the cluster, and I only want to write one entry, one single entry. This will run for four and a half hours. Find 67 million states, of which almost 14 million are unique. And so um, if I want to write two entries, well, I need to actually distribute it now across multiple servers and leave it for a week and it will find trillions and trillions of states. So what about Maelstrom? So that was TLA plus, two specifications. With Maelstrom, I didn't want to get my hands dirty with Clojure. I'm sorry to say, I just didn't feel I had time uh, for that. So there was no workload for Bookkeeper, right? So I decided, well, I'll just put a linearizable KV store on top because there's the workload for linearizable KV store, all the checkers are there. It's probably quite easy. And it's actually not difficult to implement um, in memory, you know, KV store that cares nothing about performance or anything about, you know, just a simple model. It's just a map of keys to values, a couple of indexes, which is projected from a log. So what did I implement? It's one model to rule them all. So I had to, the question is not what didn't I model? I modeled everything. Uh, is what did I model? So uh, first of all, I had to implement a toy zookeeper, not distributed, because I don't really don't. I'm not here to model zookeeper, but I had to have some of its functionality. You know, we, a KV store is not enough. I need failure detection, leader election, discovery, and that is all done through sessions. So I had to implement session management. Uh, I implemented the bookies, they're relatively simple. The KV store is more complicated because that's where most of the bookkeeper protocol exists, plus the KV store itself. And it's a lot bigger than my TLA plus. Okay, so 52 files, uh, 6,000 lines of Java. Java is verbose. Um, my personal style is not to create too many private classes, so I, I ended up with more files than maybe have been necessary. There's a lot of utility code. So I've got a lot of non-blocking code, so a lot of futures. There's a lot of things like constants for field names, return codes, a bunch of utility code. And then there's shared stuff like for sending and receiving uh, messages, um, the session management. But then when you get to the unique code, so the bookkeeper was pretty small, metadata also pretty small, somehow ended up with the same line count. Um, and the KV store is where the vast majority of the complexity is. And we got many, many more lines of code for the KV store, of which most of that is just the bookkeeper, uh, low level uh, segment lifecycle and the segment chain in. So how did I implement? How do you go about implementing a model? Um, I ended up with a single threaded event loop. 
I had first explored using, you know, multi-threading and, and having various thread pools for different things. But, you know, I don't need performance, right? If I was going for high performance, I would make it multi-threaded, but I'm going for clarity here. So I ended up with a single threaded event loop in which in any given iteration, only one thing is happening. Either I'm processing an incoming message from standard in, maybe I am handling the timeout from a message that I sent out or resuming a delay. There's all the session management messages that need to be sent out periodically. Then there's the kind of, you know, most of, a lot of what is happening is reactive, responding to, to incoming messages. But some of it is proactive. So a bookie has to expire long poll reads. Don't worry about what they are. Metadata store has to expire sessions. And that's all around the failure detection and discovery. Then the KV store itself, which has all the logic of the segments and everything, it needs to be checking leadership. We have to start log readers and writers. We have to replicate. We have to apply operations to our KV store. There's a bunch of stuff that I might have to do in any one iteration of the event loop. And this is just an example of some, some code, my KV store node. Uh, in the event loop, one of the things it does is it invokes the role-specific action. And one thing you'll notice about this is it has some similarities to how you structure TLA plus with the next state formula. This is like my next state formula. I'm saying, well, I'll maintain the session, or I'll check leadership, or I'll start a new writer, or I'll close a log segment, and so on. And so, you know, in the end, this is actually how in the Maelstrom demos, they're also structured. Uh, and so I think there's actually something about this way because it makes it clear at any one moment, you know, what is this system doing? Because we're going for clarity here, not performance. And also I have to say, this is not non-deterministic. So when you have a model checker in TLA plus, you know, it will be selecting from these actions non-deterministically. Um, but in, in, in this code, it's just whichever one resolves to true first, it will take. And then when I receive messages, depending on the node, this is the metadata node. So it might respond to a new session request or get leader ID, or you know I want to update a ledger. That's also known as a segment. Uh, and I also have a print state. So that's for debugging. I can make it print out its state by sending a little message on the network. And everything is non-blocking. So it's single-threaded because I do not want to have to worry about synchronization and locks and deadlocks and everything like that. Um, but everything is highly concurrent still. You know, multiple things are going on. Maybe I'm waiting for a response from my session management, but at the same time, I have to respond to a read request from Maelstrom. Maybe I have to create a new segment and wait for the response. So everything in my code is completable futures everywhere. Completable futures just come in out my ears. And so, um, and many operations like this one to create a ledger handle, I have to do multiple actions, all of which involve sending messages, waiting for a response. So everything is through completable futures in this code. What about those invariants? So that's one thing we lost when we were playing with Maelstrom. It's like, I don't get to look inside anymore. Maelstrom doesn't see inside my state. But that's actually still true, but there's something we can still do. We can actually have local invariants inside each node, because often a node will be able to diagnose when itself, just its local state is in a bad state. And I have invariants which I have implemented in each node type. And when, there's, when it violates the invariant, it crashes the node, which ends the test. And I can go look in to see what happened. Uh, for example, uh, KV store, its position could be ahead of the closed segment, which means we've had the segment uh, truncation violation. Or the operation IDs, which should all be ordered and contiguous, are not. Or we have uncommitted entries below the committed uh, index. Uh, all these things I counted many times during my, uh, during my testing. And it's just a nice way of getting some visibility. Um, and by crashing the node, it ends the test. And the bookies, well, they didn't have anything because they're just so simple. But one thing I'd like to just say is that with the Maelstrom, there's a bunch of boilerplate that you're going to have to figure out. And it all depends on your chosen language and, and what you're building. But you know, I ended up with 
a single single threaded uh, event loop to avoid multi-threading, but you're going to have to think about a bunch of stuff. How do you, you know, respond to replies? How do you do timeouts? You know, non-blocking delays. How do you handle your errors correctly and bubble them up? And you, there's a bunch of spoil plate that you're going to have to figure out. Um, and it depends on the complexity of what you're building and your chosen language, how you do it. Choice of language is important. So on the right here, I asked my son, draw me an elegant car. And then on the left, draw me gadget car. That's super powerful. And so this is what he came up with. Um, so Ruby and Python, like you'll see from the Maelstrom demos, are wonderful for modeling. They're just really elegant, the small models. You know, types just get out of the way when you're reading the code. It's nice and simple. But we're not building distributed databases in Python or Ruby. I don't know with Python in the in the in the big data space, but I mean we're not getting distributed databases in in Ruby and Python. They're implemented in C plus plus or Java or some other Go, some other statically typed fast language. But those languages aren't necessarily suited to modeling because they're more verbose. Um, so what do you go for? Do you go for something that is better for modeling but is not your implementation language? Because maybe you want to use your model as kind of like your jump point into the implementation. So that's a question that you're going to have to answer. Model checking wins and fails. OK, what went well and what went not so well? So first of all, TLA plus, it actually found a real defect in the protocol. Uh, so. This thing where I said, hey, can the metadata get closed earlier than the actual bookies um, confirm? Uh, that was actually a real defect. Um, quite hard to trigger, but possible. And so TLA plus uh, with TLC found it. So that was one big win. Um, another win is pretty fast to find that particular um, invariant. The invariant was called no divergence between writer and metadata. And um, it finds it in about 20 seconds on my machine. And that's nice. Another great thing about the TLA plus and TLC is that when you do get an invariant violation, you get an error trace. And the error trace says, hey, what was the invariant that got violated? And then gives you the whole history of all the actions uh, the states involved. And so while it, it can be long and it can take some time, you have to draw some diagrams maybe to kind of visualize it, you've got all the information you need in the error trace. You don't have to be going anywhere else. It's all there. And it just makes it um, very easy um, to diagnose what the problem was. Maelstrom. So maybe I'm just a bad coder. coder. I don't know. But I made mistake after mistake after mistake. Run Maelstrom, boom, you're an idiot, boom. <laughs> it found it, again, in analysis invalid, analysis invalid. And it would just find it over and over again. And I was just you know, squashing bugs left, right, and center. Uh, and it really gave me some uh, in, insights into the kind of mistakes that I might actually make in a real implementation. Um, so that was really good. Then we've got a fail. Is it Maelstrom or is it me? Um, I ended up building the entire thing before I could check it. Um, so there I am writing code on weekends for like a month. Um, and I haven't even run Maelstrom yet. And so when I do run it, huge volume of mistakes. But I'm looking back at it now, and I'm thinking, well, that was probably a jack fail, because I could have started with even a non-distributed KV store, all in memory. Uh, then I could have maybe added storage as just a single node uh, at the kind of ledger uh, segment chaining uh, abstraction, and then I could have once that was working, you know, well actually now storage is distributed and implemented the lower level protocol. I could probably have done it like that and saved myself, um, you know, having to go for weeks before I could actually start um, getting confidence that what I was doing was right. OK, Maelstrom. Uh, yeah, so once I had it all run in and I got rid of all my um, mistakes, I was like, well, is it going to find this protocol bug? Right, The, the original protocol bug, protocol bug that I found, that TLA plus found for me. 
Well, I ran it and ran it and ran it. I didn't actually leave it for 10 days. It was a highly parallelized. So, but still 10, you know, computing days and no, it didn't find it. So I was like, okay, well, you know, part of the defect is that a key message is lost. Okay. It's not delivered. So I'm going to hard code that still doesn't happen. Then I'm like, well, actually this only happens during leader failover and, you know, I can't really get leader, leader failover to happen uh, you know, at a good enough rate through the, through the existing workload. So I thought, yeah, I'm not making my own workload yet. I'm just going to hard code that after three seconds, I start dropping keeper lives. So I'm getting three seconds, I'm getting leader failovers. Still didn't find it. So then I was like, well, how do I increase the likelihood? Well, I need some overlap. Part of the bug is that there's a particular overlap of messages between two clients. And so I added hard-coded 100 milliseconds, and boom, I found it. But it wasn't Jepson that found it. It was my local invariant, which crashed the node. But anyway, I now had confidence that I had implemented the protocol correctly because it was failing uh, as desired. Uh, so I turned off the invariant check-in to see if Jepson would find it. And, and yes, it would. It just took five days for Jepson to detect it. Um, because as I said, the, particularly with this way this protocol works, is that some internal states just don't manifest externally. Um, they don't always, not to all clients. So I re-enabled the local invariants. I removed the hard-coded delays. And I just started playing with the Maelstrom network latency. So I started putting in random latency to see if I could get this overlap that I wanted. And yeah, after five days, it hit. So the question is, would I have found this? I mean, I knew what I was looking for. And I worked. This took me so long to get to the point where I could make it find it. And I knew what I was looking for. So I just don't know if I would have found it. And in fact, you know, a lot of the chaos testing that has been run on Bookkeeper didn't find it. So, you know, who's to say? Okay, so the big question with a lot of these modeling, you know, TLA plus and things is, well, that's great, but it's just it's just verifying my design. What about my implementation? Right? Um, and this is like the big question. Um, so our model is built small. It's built for clarity, simplicity. We, we, we don't care about performance, right? We don't care about security or anything like that. Whereas our implementation, you know, it, clarity and simplicity are important, but do we really care that much? What we really have to have is features, performance, and all the other things that go into it. So how do these worlds kind of get together? Um, well, with TLA Plus, I would say, I'll go back here. TLA Plus, you know, TLS doesn't care about the implementation. It just doesn't. Uh, and you're going to have to live with that. Uh, the, you will have to map the implementation to your specification uh, as you see fit. But with Maelstrom, I will say that you've already taken some steps. So logging, right. If you don't do good logging with Maelstrom, and it says in analysis invalid, and you haven't got good logs, you will not know why it failed. I see that it said the read returned three when it should be four, but I don't know how the system got into that state. So you, it teaches you to do good logging. And I think that will carry over to the implementation. Also, the power of this network shim, the standard in and standard out. Man, if I was going to build Bookkeeper from scratch based on my model, I would probably consider just keeping Maelstrom around. I would keep that network kind of shim in there and just allow my actual real implementation to carry on using Maelstrom because it's just so convenient, you know? Um, and, you know, it's likely that maybe you'll get some insights into the kind of mistakes made in your implementation, but your model is all about simplicity. You're using it to learn, to communicate, to find out how to build this thing. It is not built for performance. Uh, so how much of that code can you actually reuse? I mean, I don't know. It's a case by case basis. But what I come away feeling is that this ants this question of how do you go from the model to the implementation? I, I feel like with Maelstrom, you're a little bit closer. Uh, there's definitely things that carry over, but it's not everything. You can't just, you know, use I can't use my single threaded event loop for my implementation. The implementation will look very different.
So what are my final thoughts? Uh, are they adversaries or are they kind of best friends that can work together? So the good parts, for me at least, because I've spent two or three years now working with TLA Plus. So I've written enough specifications so that I am now not just fighting the language, right? It's like sketching for me. I just, you know, start expressing myself in TLA Plus and it just kind of comes. So it's nice free flowing. I really feel like it is. Uh, you know, I'll reach for TLA Plus before maybe sketching it out on paper. Um, but it's taken time for me to get there. So if you're new, this isn't necessarily going to apply to you. Uh, you know, a specification tends to be in one file. So you can kind of keep it in your head. It's uh, everything's there in front of you. And the model checker usually can find defects pretty fast. And when it does find them, you can see exactly what happened. There's no, oh, I'm missing some logs, or I have to parse through you know, megabytes of logs. It's just you know, a rather simple trace, and you can find out what happened. So a Maelstrom, what's great? Well, it's just your code, your favorite language, right? You don't need to learn TLA+. Plus. You, know, you can just use your language that you've already got, you know, I don't know, 5, 10, 15 years experience with. You can inspect the network, what's going on. It's just standard in and standard out. It's all in the logs there for you. It's so easy to run. It's so convenient. Uh, there's no mini cube or servers or network or anything. Um, and from, in my experience, your dumb mistakes, and even maybe not so dumb, is pretty quick at finding them. What about the challenges? So again, if you're new to TLA+, it is a bit of a steep learning curve. I, I just kind of fell in love with it. So despite it being difficult, I just kind of worked through it and, and, and just went with it. So I think you have to be motivated. I think you have to maybe have a good reason to use TLA+, um, and, then, and then you get the motivation maybe to, to, to learn it. I personally took about two weeks to, of evenings studying, watching videos, and I produced my first useful specification. It wasn't hugely complicated, but it was non-trivial, and it actually found a defect in my protocol I was designing at the time. Um, then there's the battle in the state space. So, you know, if you're using the model checker TLC, like me, um, state space is a problem. When you've got 10 trillion states and it takes a week running on very expensive servers, you know, you start spending time optimizing, maybe tweaking the spec to reduce the state space, maybe implementing parts of TLA plus in Java and using the overrides to get some better performance. Then you've got the problems of, is it success or not? Sometimes it can say it's good, but it's because you didn't actually, um, you know, the spec isn't doing everything you think it is. And so you have to spend, you know, uh, some time working to make sure that what you think is success really is. And I don't know if we'll have time to discuss that further offline. Um, Maelstrom, the analysis is time consuming, even when you get, and analysis valid. There are so many ways that the system may not be doing what you think it can be doing. So maybe leader election is like failing like 10 times, but on the 11th, it works, you know, and that's fine because, you know, everything worked in the end, but you can find all kinds of non non optimum uh, behavior in, in the logs. And then even when, and when it says it's failed, you have to parse the logs. I don't find that the the visualizations necessarily help because you know it's a maybe there's been two thousand messages exchanged and it was a thousand messages ago that the bad state started so um, it, it does take time to analyze then you've got all your boilerplate you've got to work out how you're going to do uh, you know all the boilerplate of sending receiving timeouts everything like that can be a bit more complex it really depends if you look at the demos they're not complex so. You know, I think it depends on how complex the system you're modeling, what your chosen language is. But I found it a little less free-flowing because I had more code. It was less easy to change, and it was harder to keep it in my head. So I would say use them for their strengths um, is, is, my, is my advice. So they are very different tools. TLA plus is abstract. 
and it was built to be abstract. Um, you know, Leslie Lamport saw the existing kind of modeling and formal verification tooling out there, and he wanted something abstract. And it's this abstraction which is which is its strength. And so we choose it for its abstraction. And so, you know, it's this algorithmic thinking. Um, and it's totally understandable by engineers. We don't need to be maths geniuses um, to use this stuff. You know, regular engineers, give them a couple of weeks and they'll get started on it. Um, and so, you know, you don't have all the clutter of programming concepts. This is like your whiteboarding, you know? Um, and with Maelstrom, what I like about it is it really truly is distributed. You know, it's really in true time. It forces you to think in terms of distributed systems. It, it's, with TLA Plus, we can build it that way, but it doesn't have to be that way. But with Maelstrom, you've got no choice. You know, one node can only talk to another through message passing. And so it straight away gets you into that uh, way of thinking, uh, can give you some real insights into how you might code the, the, the implementation, some of the problems that you'll come up against. The fact that you need excellent login in your model to be able to diagnose failures, that definitely would carry over to an implementation. And I haven't said this word yet in the talk, but prototype. I feel that Maelstrom is very much a kind of model or prototype. You know, I, <laughs> philosophical, I, I don't know. But I feel it's more on the prototype side. Um, and also that I would say that Maelstrom could be useful beyond just the modeling stage. I would definitely consider using uh, Maelstrom as I'm doing the implementation or something like it, you know, having this shim so that I can uh, simulate the network uh, with some kind of tool, uh, just like uh, there's deterministic uh, simulation. And so that's very interesting. So if I were to choose, you know, there is no choice. It really depends on your situation, your experience, what you're modeling. But I could imagine you could even choose both. If I were to use both, I would definitely use TLA Plus first. I would be using it first to explore the high-level design, get some confidence that it is right, and then look at doing a lower-level model with Maelstrom. Maybe you're thinking, what, I have to do both? It's like, it really depends on your use case. These, some of these systems are so complex and take so long to build. You know, Adding an extra couple of weeks or a month at the beginning of the project can save you know, who knows how much time and heartache when you're encountering problems. So I do think that modeling um, is helpful. Right, but it's no silver bullet. Okay, you will, you know, with an implementation, you know, there's so many things with the implementation, you know, all the code is just belonging to that implementation, all your high performance coding, the idiosyncrasies of the network, of the file system, all of that exists and there's nothing you can do about it. Modeling is just, the idea is to help us build the right thing, uh, help us at the beginning understand the problem space better, understand our proposed design better, the nuances that it might have, the pitfalls that we can avoid. But when it comes to the implementation, you've still got to figure all that out. And so you'll still end up going to need something like Jepson or some similar tool to get confidence that your implementation is correct. So I would like to first thank my son, who was uh, doing many of the the little pictures of these cute little uh, square people. Uh, so thanks to him. He's only nine, so I'm quite impressed with his drawing. Uh, so he got paid for this. So um, what what's next? So I would recommend that you check out uh, Jepson IO, learn about consistency levels if this is something that interests you. Uh, go check out GitHub, the Maelstrom. It's got the demos. Play. You can run the demos really trivial to run them locally, play with the code. You can find out about all my TLA plus work at Bookkeeper in, uh, in, in that repo there under my name. And also, you can check out my uh, Maelstrom uh, model or prototype uh, in GitHub as well. So I also would like to say that there is a TLA plus workshop 
uh, in this conference. And so I highly recommend you attend. We didn't have time to go into you know, the mechanics of TLA Plus itself, just no time. So if you are interested in TLA Plus, do check out the workshop. Okay, and that's it, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jack, so much. It was a really, really interesting talk, and we have a few questions in the chat, which I would be happy to ask. And I think we'll start with one of the questions from Ivan. Uh, and uh, he's asking about uh, recommendation for size of the projects. So especially like when apply TLA plus or Milestrom and do, do we only do it for like big distributed projects or we can use it only for small tools. So what, what's your entry stage for it? Like when um, you'll say, yeah, I need to use it. Honestly, for most things that are distributed, it's surprising how something that seems simple actually has edge cases that you never considered. So I use it all the time um, just to answer you know, simple questions. Maybe I'm reviewing, for example, when I was uh, with RabbitMQ, there was a library that was doing the balancing of queues. So it was using some features in a clever way to balance queues over uh, uh, without any consensus stores. It was just clever use of, and I wanted to understand, well, is it safe? What is its liveness like? Uh, and, you know, it seemed good. It seemed right. And uh, and so I just did it in TLA Plus, and yeah, it was safe. But it turned out it had some liveness problems that I hadn't considered. And then we explored it further. It was like, oh, wow, yeah, there's some kind of nasty uh, liveness where it could actually take a long time to complete. And then we actually figured out a really simple solution, and we were able to show that it was uh, it was a good solution, and that it reduced the the liveness problem down massively. So, and that was you know relatively simple, just you know client server problem. So it doesn't have to be complicated. I would say for me it's easier because I've verified complex problems. Now I can just whip it out when I need to just do, do something quick. So, but. It depends. All right. Yeah, it, it depends. It's most common answer to m multiple problems. Uh, but uh, do I get it right? It's like whenever you see the distributed nature of your system, you potentially should consider bo both of them uh, in the way how you described it in the presentation, starting with TLA plus and then continue with M Maltstrom. It depends as if your system is one that has, uh, you know, is it something which has data consistency levels, you know? Um, can it be expressed in a way that uh, Jepson can test it? So that's, you know, one limitation. Mm -hmm. Hey, awesome. So, thank you so much for this answer. And uh, we have another question from Timur, who is asking, I always thought that the point of Jepson testing is to run actual implementation under the stress. And, that's right. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. his point. And ca can you just talk a bit more how Jepson live together with Malstrom and uh, for for this kind of testing? So um, Malstrom is just kind of like, uh, it's kind of like this wrapper that um, it is the network, if you know what I mean. It runs your nodes. You know, when mm -hmm. you actually run a real Jepson test, it's actually got to deploy your real implementation. It has to, the network has to be really there. Um, and then you know you run Jepson and it and it does everything, all these checks and, and and perturbations. But with Maelstrom, it's a lot more convenient because it's just a local process on on your computer. Uh, the network is Maelstrom passing messages between between nodes. So it's perfect if you know because when you write a model, if you want to do a model or a prototype, do you really want to be having to work with you know, networking libraries, which might have some complexity to them. Um, standard in and standard out is so simple. Uh, and that's really what we want from modeling. We want simplicity. And it's harder to get more simple than standard in and standard out for the network. Mm -hmm. OK, yeah, probably one question from me. Is it uh, enough of power in this tool to mo model network and model network uh, failures and uh, I don't know, so slow down uh, or TCP windows type of stories if we need to? Um, 
you know, I <laughs> the network doesn't essentially, you know, networking doesn't exist. What you can do is introduce latency. Mm -hmm. uh, so right out of the box, right now, you've got latency uh, and network partitions. Um, you can implement your own. You need to write closure, so you have to be able to write closure. And then you could probably implement more. But this whole aspect of you know, TCP windows, it's you could. It doesn't really apply to standard in and standard out. That that level of abstraction of the network is not really there. You'd have to think about what is it that these network anomalies produce. Maybe mm -hmm. it's a one-sided partition, or maybe yeah, because maybe it's a network that's dropped on one side and alive on the other. Maybe we can simulate that at a higher level. What is that, a higher level that that produces? Um, so, and that would probably mean uh, getting your hands dirty and writing some closure to extend what's there. Okay, cool. Thank you so much for answers. And um, I'm lo looking on the list of questions. I have one holy war question, so I don't want to spend more than few minutes on it. Why not Kotlin or Groovy to get both fast and concise model of uh, implementation of uh, Maelstrom, I do believe? <laughs> uh, because I've never written code in those languages. <laughs> oh, yeah, you, just, just, just Simple as that. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable with Java. Uh, Bookkeeper is written in Java. Um, spend most of my days at the moment in Java, so it was just made sense. Because I also wanted to yeah, you know, I also write Python. I have experience with Python. I could have done it in Python, but I wanted to. Part of my experiment was to kind of see, well, what's it like to use your implementation language for the model? And I just didn't know. I wanted to know what that would be like because I'm very interested by the question of, well, how do you go from your model to your implementation? And so I actually thought it was interesting to choose Java, even though it's probably not the prettiest for modeling maybe it would actually make jump into the implementation easier. So that's why I chose Java. OK, and we have like three more minutes. So uh, one another question, any like big pitfalls from uh, using both of these tools? So um, what, what newbies should avoid or be aware about? Right, so I'll go back to one of each. So. TLA plus again. I'll go back to uh, fearing success. We fear success. It says, you know, yes. There's, you know, no invariants have been violated. You know, there's no counterexamples. Brilliant. And so we're, you know, really happy with ourselves. But it turns out that it's not true. We just have a bug in our spec so that certain valid state transitions are not happening. And so. To get confidence in the specification, once you've got what you think is working, then you have to test it. And then you have to start maybe putting in invariants for valid states that you think it should arrive at. So you're thinking, well, it should arrive at this particular state. So you put an invariant in, and then you find, oh, it didn't violate. And what's this? <laughs> but it should. And then you're like down the rabbit hole of finding why that is. And on the Maelstrom side, Again, the tricky side I found about it was that internal states don't always manifest externally. And while we've got these really nice um, visualizations for the message passing, you know, it might fail four minutes in. And it's, you know, it's done 10,000 operations by then, or maybe even 100,000 operations. Where in that <laughs> huge list of messages did it occur? And then you know, you're into searching the logs. And I actually found the logs from my own code the most useful in the end for diagnosing how the internal states got messed up. And that's when I also stumbled on the fact that I can be kind of running these assertions in my code, but the type of assertion that you would never be able to do in production code, because it's like, well, I'm going to scan everything. I'm going to scan my entire log to make sure it's in the right state in, in every time I receive a message, um, things like that. So there's definitely, they are expert tools. Both are expert tools, and they need experts to run them. And to become an expert, you just need to play with it, and you need to spend time with them. And uh, I remember you said it take you years to get, get used to the specification. And uh, for no, last not minute, years. No, not years. No, hey, I mean, mm -hmm. so carrier. 
<laughs> yeah, just, just any good advice for people who would like to start with it or get to advanced level, what, what to focus on? Um, well, first of all, I recommend, you know, watch the video series, the video tutorials on YouTube. Personally, I found those the most useful. And then, you know, uh, I did different things just while I was learning. I, I, I for example, I, I use Kafka a lot as a, as a consultant. And I, you know, I learned how Kafka worked in detail internally. And so I went through the bugs and I found a protocol defect. And I thought, okay, well, I'm going to implement Kafka with the protocol defect and see if I can like make TLC find it. And mm -hmm. I could. And so, you know, it really depends. I mean, if you're curious and you enjoy it, you'll find ways to to play with it and, you know, get Hey. Get into stuff. So. So, 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 thank you so much. We will continue our discussion in discussion zone and uh, getting back to Alexei. Yeah, hey, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jack, for your talk, and thank you very much, Mike, for the support. And uh, in the very end of the talk, I want to just remind to our audience that uh, every talk, including this one, I have a discussion area, discussion zone. And if you want to join uh, our Zoom session with Jack and Mike, please press the uh, video camera button just behind the player, uh, it's yellow button, and connect our Zoom discussion that uh, will start, I think, in one or two minutes uh, after this moment. Again, uh, thank you very much, Jack. And thank you very much, Mike. It's a great honor for Hydro to have you on board this year. Uh, that's uh, thank you for your time. Good. Thank See you. See you a bit later. Yeah.